Peter, I'd like to move on now to um, your life in the new territories and your leisure time right. in the in the 70s and the kind of late 60s. Can you tell me about what you would do on the weekends in the new territories? Well, it was so much easier in those days to hire a little fishing junk and go fishing. Mm -hmm. And I could sit on my balcony at Silver Strand overlooking Port Shelter, which is one of the most beautiful bodies of water in the world, I think. And I could see flotillas of junks sailing out for the evenings fishing. In those days, fishermen were still operating junks. And Sai Kung had fleets of junks. And to see a whole convoy of junks going out into the sunset was a... Well, it wasn't the sunset, of course, it was the sunrise in those days. Or the moonset, if you like, because I was staring east. But to see that huge body of vessels on the water, it's a wonderful sight. In those days, we never thought much of it. We didn't think it was... there would be an end to it. But the end came when they had mechanized trawlers, of course. And I was on one of the first experimental trawlers um, to be tried out in Hong Kong waters. Thanks to the Agriculture and Fisheries Department, who put a lot of effort into designing a suitable vessel. And we were doing trial runs in the Lama Channel in the 60s, mid-60s, 65, 66. And we suddenly came to a grinding halt, and it's almost the trawler almost sort of slipped backwards. The net had caught on something big underwater. And we thought we'd hit an American submarine trying to sort of silently enter Hong Kong waters um, in a submarine fashion. Because whatever it was at the end of the net was of enormous weight. And the booms were actually beginning to bend under the weight of this thing. Anyway, we, to retrieve the net, we had to winch whatever it was aboard. And it turned out to be the undercarriage of a Dakota aircraft, yeah. which um, apparently had been lost back in the 50s and lost at sea without trace. And part of this undercarriage had just been caught in the tidal flow and ended up in the Lama Channel. Did you find out who had flown the plane at all? Well, the stainless steel on the undercarriage was so of such high quality, it hadn't corroded, and you could still make out the serial number on, on the main um, strut of the undercarriage. So the Agriculture and Fisheries Department said they were going to try and find out through the you know, aeronautical channels which aircraft that it belonged to, I'm not sure if they ever succeeded. I never kept in touch with them. And what about the, the main Hong Kong harbour itself? Did that have a lot of junks and activity on it in the 60s and 70s? Yes, because those were the days before container ships, when it was still possible, you know, to... And people were still arriving on board ship. I mean, that was still a popular way to to sail into Hong Kong. Uh, civil servants at the end of their contracts were sailing home, not flying. Mm -hmm. You'd go on home leave, that's why they had long leaves in those days, because so much of the leave would be taken up with your passage on board ship. And I, we were always going down to the docks in Kowloon to either wave goodbye to or welcome back some colleague in the civil service. And yet it was very much more of a maritime city in those days. You were, you were more conscious of your connection with the sea, which is something we seem to have lost. Mm -hmm. um, and the harbour was a fantastic spectacle from the peak or from any high ground, because there'd be so many vessels anchored and so many um, little uh, junks and pontoon things, barges going out to them, and Walla Wallas, which seemed to have disappeared. I mean, there were fleets of Walla Wallas in those days. If you missed the last ferry to Kowloon, you could get onto a Walla Walla. It's like a taxi. 
What were they? Were they just little rafts, or were they kind of speedboat type? They were little speedboat things, little cabins that accommodated about hundred and twenty people, um, and they were they were just waiting for hire, just like the old rickshaws used to in the old days. So it was of no consequence to, to hire a Walla Walla to go across if you miss the ferry. It was just a little bit more expensive. But to, to reach many of the ships in the harbour you'd have to get a Walla Walla and go out and visit them. So yes, you were much more conscious of this, the harbour as an integral part of Hong Kong, which we've lost now. The harbour is so much smaller for a start. And of course you took the, the Star Ferry to work every day. Yes, the only way to cross the harbour in those days was by Star Ferry or by Vehicular Ferry. And you'd have to queue for a long time for the Vehicular Ferry, but it was good fun. It made you think more about the necessity of making the cross harbour trip if you had to queue with all the other vehicles for an hour in the sun. I mean, once the tunnel was invented, of course, it was a cinch. But you know, I can remember when a whole helicopter ride across the harbour was $25. Back in 72, it's either 75 or 25 or $30. I thought I would splurge by taking a helicopter to Kai Tak rather than you know, have myself driven there, look for a parking space and all that nonsense. But at Harcourt Road they had a commercial helicopter service where you could check your bags in, say goodbye to them, and um, you'd be cleared through till you arrived practically at the gangway to your aircraft mm -hmm. in, at Kai Tak. And was $25 quite cheap at that time? It seemed not so then, yeah. um, but of course now, of course, you pay twenty-five dollars to go from the Star Ferry up to the peak, or more than that. Yeah. And what was Kai Tak like at that time? Very busy, and, and it became increasingly so. Of course, um, it was getting more and more crowded. But I can remember the waving gallery at Kai Tak when it was lined with Russian peasant women because we had a huge white Russian community in Hong Kong in those days and they were being slowly decanted into host countries like America or Canada or wherever and of course every time another plane load of white Russians took off all their kiss and kin would be at the waving gallery so it was like something from Dr. Zivago you know, you'd go up to the waving gallery and there were these dumpy women in their headscarves and sort of foot wrappings and handkerchiefs waving. <laughs> the waving gallery. Very rustic. So was, was Hong Kong very multicultural at that time? There's lots of different ethnic communities. I felt so. I, I actually, I don't think it's changed all that much. I'm sorry we've lost the white Russian community. Um, but we've gained enormous numbers of others in, in the interim. I mean, we've gained this huge Filipino population. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Indonesian women now, in large numbers, uh, Singalese, um, Bangladeshis. Hong Kong people have been very good at accepting foreigners in their midst. Yeah. No problem, because they know they're always going to outnumber the foreigners anyway, so the foreigners are never going to be a threat to them in terms of work or anything else. So they've always been pretty good at accepting this multi... In fact, they quite like this multicultural mix. Because Cantonese in particular are very open-minded and receptive to other cultures, I mean, other religions or whatever, as long as... It's not antisocial and doesn't get in their way. They, you know, live and let live. And, um, in the end, that's what happened when they repealed the law on homosexuality too, which is great because we have a very live and let live community here. And when did that happen? When was the law repealed? 
late 80s, I late think. 80s, yeah. yeah, it's about 88, somewhere around there. Was that quite late in comparison to Europe, for example? Oh, yes, yes. much later than yeah, Europe. Much later, yeah. Yes, a great relief to the government, because of course we were in countdown by then. Mm -hmm. um, the writing was on the wall, we knew we were going to go back to China. Can you tell me about that time in the 80s? What was, what was the atmosphere like? There was considerable anxiety, which led to another major exodus, bigger than the one that had taken place in the 67 troubles. Um, people desperate to get passports as fail-safe situations, you know. Mm. If the worst comes to the, came to the worst, they could find some other port in the storm. Uh, but some of them uprooted themselves for life. And you know, I always had the feeling then that the time would come when they would regret this decision. I was quite optimistic about what would happen to Hong Kong. Because I could see that the changes in China were dramatic. I mean, China was making such enormous strides and I thought the time will come when, you know, that, that government in Beijing will will <coughs> firstly acknowledge that Hong they still need Hong Kong, but uh, the time will come when the rest of China is just as on a par with Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And then those people who fled will be regretting that they ever made that decision to go. I left myself, but that was for the reason that I didn't think I would be able to continue working in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. not because I had any fears for the future of Hong Kong stability. Um, I am really impressed with the progress we've continued to make in the post-handover years. I mean, it's now 12 years since handover, amazingly. Do you think those fears were fed by the media? Oh, yes. I was so angry about the way the media were making such a meal out of 97. You know, when Jan Morris came to visit me here, I said to her, I'd love to grab some of those journalists by the scruff of the neck and rub their noses on the progress we've made since. And she gently reminded me that she'd been writing about Hong Kong herself. Um, Although never in, in such pessimistic terms. Oh, the media, I mean, the way they talked about the Red Guards and the PLA rolling over the border in tanks and depriving us of our liberties. It was ridiculous. Was it just to sensationalize it to sell stories or do you think people actually believed that that would happen? Well, I think some of them actually did believe. They, they did have this worst scenario belief. Um, they had no faith in, in what China would do, even though the joint declaration had made it clear that Hong Kong would continue um, for another 50 years. And I think the Chinese have kept to that promise. Yeah. You know, I mean, a few ripples here and there, but nothing of, of major consequence. And what was the attitude towards um, the British in the 1980s? We were largely treated as a separate society. Um, accepted, yes, but slightly kept at a distance. Never allowed to feel that we were part of the general fabric of the place. We were like some separate layer, like oil on top of the water or something. I don't know, you know, there was relatively little osmosis between the, ch the, the Chinese and the expatriate population. Even though I had wonderful colleagues that were great friends, we would meet over a restaurant dinner table, but our lives would not intertwine all that much outside of the workplace. Whereas now, in the post-97 period, I feel very much more a part of this place. People, people seem to go out of their way to show how happy they are to accept us. 
and it's they will strike up conversations which never used to happen before. Um, I have friends on this island that uh, really have introduced themselves and made the effort to, you know, get initiate the conversation. And I think it's wonderful that people here are so helpful. A case in point, dear Aileen Bridgewater, this close friend of mine, had a breakdown. Her car developed a puncture on the Tolo Highway, which is a very fast thoroughfare, as you know. She'd never repaired a puncture in her life, so she was helpless by the side of the road, wondering on how on earth to get out of this predicament, when three taxis separately stopped to see if they could assist her. Between them, they had taken the spare tire out, they had the wheel on, they had her back on the road in minutes, refused to accept any payment. Now that's remarkable. You wouldn't have that happen on an autobahn in Germany, I'm sure. <laughs> or on the M1, the police would have to be sent for to tow you away. <laughs> Why do you think that, that change has happened post-97? Well, I think because people here know that the, those Brits who used to be running the show are no longer in charge. And it's a different ball game now. We're all Hong Kong people together. And uh, those of us who are still here are just part of the general population. We're not on some separate sphere, you know, separate level of existence. We're accepted. We're they make us feel more at home. I had a, an accident in the Golden Arcade shopping plaza in Sham Shui Po. I hit my head on a low beam. I was perfectly all right. There was a bit of blood. But I wasn't allowed to proceed on my way. I wanted to continue shopping. I thought I'd just mop a handkerchief occasionally to my scalp. Everybody rushed out of the shops. They had me sitting on a stool. They were serving me tea, phoning for an ambulance. And I was grumbling and saying, I, I just want to carry on shopping. No, look at you. You're covered in blood. How can you, you know? You poor thing. <laughs> Stay quiet. <laughs> I was treated indulgently, you know, and pampered with tea and friendliness until the ambulance arrived. And that was lovely. And I thought, the interesting thing about Hong Kong is you can go about your life in a normal tenor of things. You're not even conscious of other people on the street. There's no eye contact. They, they don't normally nod or acknowledge your presence. But if something goes wrong, they will stop and they will do something to help mm. and that's a wonderful feeling you know mm. because I've got a feeling that if I fall unconscious in the street I'm not going to be lying there very long mm. people will come and start doing things because it's a caring society and um, I don't think I would find that same reception anywhere else I just it's one of the things I love about Hong Kong.